Legends and Losers is brought to you by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge your growth right now at netsuite.com slash legends. Today, my friend, the truly extraordinary Dr. Giora Yaron. Giora is the guy who is really known in Israel and frankly in Silicon Valley as a technology startup legend. He currently serves as the chairman of Tel Aviv University and is a strategic advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Defense. We have an incredible conversation about startups, building companies, being successful, life, the power of service, hard work, and perseverance. He talks about how to build an ecosystem like they have in Israel and why having a Jewish mother is a strategic business advantage. All right, all right, all right. Joy Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead, and I am so stoked that you are here for this episode with Dr. Giora Iron. And um, to say that having him back in my life is a thrill and is, is a joy it would be an understatement. And um, from the minute we uh, taped this conversation, uh, we've been dying to share it with you. Now, organizations like Lucky Jeans. Lucky Jeans, I don't know who Lucky Jeans are. <laughs> Lucky Jeans, William Sonoma, the Boston Globe, and Kiva.org rely on our good friends at NetSuite to turbocharge their growth. NetSuite is a cloud-based business management platform that gives uh, growing companies, entrepreneurs, the platform they need for growth and gives them real-time visibility into all areas of your operation. For example, if you were out of inventory of a particular item, you would know that immediately, your website would know that you're sold out, and your team would be alerted that it's time to order more. So you get real-time visibility into what's going on in your business to synchronize your business, integrate invoicing, uh, keep your customers happy, uh, manage your cash flow, manage your people, and more. The other interesting thing about NetSuite, in Kevin Maney's new book, Unscaled, he makes the case that because of cloud technology and all the good new stuff that's going on that NetSuite is at the forefront of, that being a large organization is actually a disadvantage. And so not only does is NetSuite one of the companies that provides technology to level the playing field, you could even argue that NetSuite provides an unfair competitive advantage for growing businesses uh, who have to deal with and compete with big lumbering companies. Now for Legends and Losers listeners, NetSuite has an amazing program right now. Go to uh, netsuite.com slash legends and you can schedule a one hour consultation for free, or as the French say, gratis, <laughs> or gratuit, um, to talk about growth in your business. What are the barriers to growth? What are the opportunities for growth? And uh, as every company um, is moving forward, they all have to deal with, you know, the good news when you're growing is you're growing. The bad news is you got to get your arms around it and you need the platform for growth. So at netsuite.com slash legends, you'll get an opportunity to schedule a one hour conversation with a growth expert in your industry about uh, how you can turbocharge your growth. So check them out today at netsuite.com slash legends. Now, if you're new to Legends and Losers, I want to thank you and welcome you. And if you're a longtime listener, um, you know, there's just no excuse for that. <laughs> Dr. Gior Yaron serves as the chairman of Tel Aviv University, which is the largest university in Israel and has over 30,000 students. He also is on the board of publicly traded $10 billion Amdocs. And he is a strategic advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Defense. In Israel, and frankly, in Silicon Valley, um, he's a legend in the startup world. He's been a founder, co-founder, or investor in more than 25 successful companies. He cut his teeth as an officer in the Israeli Defense Forces. He started his business career, or really his business career flourished at, uh, at um, National Semiconductor. He went on to become the president of Indigo NV and take them public on NASDAQ. And... I met him at Mercury Interactive where he served on the board. And when we got into trouble at Mercury, when the company was investigated by the Securities and Exchange Commission over stock option backdating, uh, here's what happened. We had to fire our CEO and chairman, our CFO and general counsel in this, on the same day. Our stock plummeted, 
Our competitors came after us. A lot of our people thought about leaving the company and to say we were in deep shit would be to put it mildly. It's always interesting to me at those moments of truth, who stands up and who, who craters. Giori own stood up with many people who were terrified in our company. Not only did he stand up, he became chairman of the board. Imagine somebody on what might feel like the Titanic says, hey, uh, wanna be the new chairman of the Titanic? Most people would say no. Giora said yes. And he had a huge hand in the successful outcome at Mercury, which we had. We sold the company about uh, 10 months later, nine months later to Hewlett Packard for four and a half billion dollars. Dr. Yaron holds a PhD in device physics from Hebrew, Hebrew University and many patents. The Israeli press calls him the Rambo of business. Here he is, my friend, Dr. Giora Yaron. How do you spell retired? <laughs> <laughs> no way. I'm going to walk my way into the grave until I'm covered with a marble stone. Don't yeah. Worry. Well, uh, being an entrepreneur, being, a, I don't know, a hustler, uh, it, it's kind of, it seems like it's in your DNA. It is very much so. Yeah. I, uh, but you know, others have said it before me. If you enjoy what you are doing, you'll never walk a day in your life. So I don't know. I'm still looking for, for, for some real work, but for the time being, <laughs> I enjoy every piece of it. And how do you, uh, if you think about your life today where, you know, you've got lots of different things that you're doing, you're on boards, you're making investments, you're involved, of course, with the university, uh, et cetera. Um, so you do all these multiple projects versus back when you were, uh, you know, a full-time, if you will, entrepreneur focused primarily on, on uh, uh, one company. How, how does that feel to you today versus back when you were building one comp company in particular? Well, uh, after a while, it gets boring, you know. Uh, you identify an entrepreneur, you sit down with him, uh, with the napkin, uh, this works, this doesn't work, this works, this doesn't work. You put money in, you build the company, you sell the company, you do the next one, you sell the next one. After a while, it kind of becomes redundant and boring. <laughs> uh, money, is, money is interesting, but uh, meaning we all have one set of pants, one set of shoes that we can wear at a time. So, I mean, what are you going to do? At the end of the day, you need to enjoy what you are doing. So it's not about money. And so how do you think about your life today? I think it's very balanced. You know, I'm kind of, uh, if you want to look at it in uh, buckets, it's uh, really divided into three buckets. Uh, one is entrepreneurship, and I'm doing more of the same. I have today uh, five companies I'm invested in, I'm active Germany, and I'm what have you. And they're in different phases, so some of them require more time, some of them require less time. Uh, so that's kind of the original leg, so to speak. The second leg I've added uh, over the years, or I've been asked to add, is uh, the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we do, you know, we live in a non-friendly neighborhood. Our neighbors don't necessarily love us. And they, they outnumber us zillions. So, so it's, a, it's a hostile neighborhood and there's lots of them. <laughs> no, 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 not like the one we have. We did a great job selecting our neighborhood. <laughs> I you meant know, the Middle East as the neighborhood, not necessarily where you live in Tel Aviv. Yeah, no, no, I mean, if you look, you can't see what I'm seeing now. I'm seeing a bumper to bumper, uh, meaning something that even the Silicon Valley doesn't have uh, in terms of uh, what's happening here. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very quiet uh, from a security standpoint, probably one of the most secure cities I can think about today. But to get to that point, uh, that requires lots of technology, lots of technology. Look and so what, when did you become an advisor to the Ministry of Defense? You know, it's interesting. I, uh, it actually started with uh, me being in the States in, uh, I think I was in the States once between, I lived in the Valley once between uh, 78 and 82. And uh, yeah, it was when I came back. So I came back to the same reserve unit. And uh, 
basically it was impossible. Uh, you know, I was in Lebanon, they called it Iron Triangle. It's a, it was a very hostile area. Uh, and uh, every night I would basically get up on the top of the roof and have to communicate back to the US. Uh, so it from, was- from, from Lebanon? From Lebanon, of course. Yeah. So, but it's not from Lebanon. It's from Lebanon and there's shooting and, and you know, you're an officer. You have a job to do, so to speak. So at the same point, it really did make sense uh, to continue. I was building a national semiconductor fab in Israel, major investment. And here you disappear for uh, 30, 45 days. I mean, you can't just disappear. And you can't yeah. tell the contractors or the customers and whatever, listen, I'm in Lebanon, they're shooting, I'll call you back in 45. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm busy, right. So at the same point, it didn't make sense. And I told the guys, they didn't want me to leave. It's the same bodies I've been with for a very long time. So I said, okay, 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 we understand. Let's see if we can give you something that's less active, uh, which is an operations commander. So it's not really the guy that uh, really commands uh, the units. It's kind of more the planning thing, the operational thing. It's more a staff position. Yeah, an easy uh, job you can do in your part-time. Exactly. <laughs> But, but it wasn't like me because I used to do everything that I do. I had to bring it to perfection. And here you learn from the U.S. and you didn't have time to study the area. And I finally said, guys, listen, it's not working. I'm going to end up having people killed because I'm not doing my job. So why don't we think about something else? And all the time they wanted me to move into, we have an equivalent to DARPA here in Israel. It's called Mafat. Uh, which is to really uh, suck your brain, so to speak, and see what kind of technology uh, you've been exposed to that can be helpful. So they recruited me, and through that, I got to know them, they got to know me, and when uh, the project Iron Dawn came to center stage, and I'm a semiconductor guy by profession, uh, they pulled me in, and since then, I'm kind of involved in a variety of defense related projects and we have a lot of them yeah I, I i bet and so how interesting for you now in your career giora to you know have had the military service that you did and i'd, I'd love if you shared me or shared with me a little more about your military ser service when you're active but to have had the the military career that you had and then to have had the entrepreneurial technology career that you've had and of course now the two things are, are coming together where your insights into leading technology are helping you uh, work with the Israeli defense uh, organization. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, this kind of a, a discussion uh, unrelated to me, uh, what really got Israel to be as good as it is, a startup nation? And there's a school of thought that says, gee, it has to do with the Israeli intelligence units. Uh, you know, they have this number 8200, the 9XXX, and all that type of stuff. Uh, and that's the source, so to speak, of Startup Nation. And in all my talks, I say, guys, that's BS. It has nothing to do with the intelligence unit. It really has to do with the military service at core. Because if it was to do with uh, technology, USS DARPA, you know, the small DARPA thing, and it's, I mean, it's huge. So who are we to come and claim that because of some two or three intelligent units that we have, that are great, by the way, they're outstanding, they're the best, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not by mistake that the US has sent the first guy to the moon and, you know, some other stuff. So out of all modesty, I don't think it has to do with the service is specifically intelligence unit. It has to do with you being a young kid at the age of, at the age of 19, you become a company commander, you're responsible for lives, you're responsible for soldiers, you have about 150 of those, you go between, uh, beyond enemy lines, you have to bring them back alive, you have to make sure they have food, you have to make sure they have place to sleep, you have to keep them alive. It, uh, in a, you mature very quickly. 
Well, and I assume you have to be an incredible communicator and, and obviously a leader. And you have leader, to be somebody leader, who can perform under tremendous pressure. It's leader, leader, leader. It's leadership, leadership, leadership. That's, if you, and in that regards, you know, when you think about startups and you think about military service, lots of similarities. Uh, you know, the people being quoted saying business is a war. Business is a war. It's without blood. It's without some other elements that you do have in the battlefield. But uh, it's a war. It, there's a lot of fun. Let, let's talk about, we talked about how it is in the military side. Let's talk about it how it's the startup side. Well, you have to make sure there's enough money in the bank. You need to make sure there's a lot of disappointments. Uh, you thought you were going to get a purchase order. It didn't come in. Then you lived through that. Who am I to... Uh, to give you a pitch. So there's a lot of similarities living in a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknown. Uh, but the typical uh, entrepreneur uh, gets to it after he's gone through uh, the university, he's now uh, 25, 27 years old, and what have you. And in Israel, uh, especially when I was there, I was drafted in uh, 1966. November 66, and I did only the regular service and obviously the reserve service. So that was three years at the time. But it was really, except for the first, uh, I, I got drafted in November 66. The Six Day War started in uh, June uh, 67. So with the exception of uh, eight months, so to speak, that was relatively quiet. Uh, for the rest of the military service, it was the Six-Day War, the Retrition War. Later on in reserves, it was the Yom Kippur War. And you are constantly under fire, and you kind of, you know, in Hebrew we say Saifa and Safra, which is the sword and the book. So you live by, you have a sword and you have a book. You go to the university to get a physics degree, and you're being called to, uh, to service. And so it's kind of... One, one, one moves into the other and the other moves into the, the first and it's kind of So were thing. you able to work on your education at all d during that time? How, or how does that work? So you have uh, three years of regular service. Yes. I was in a combat unit called the uh, Golani, uh, which again is, was constant under fire. Uh, in fact, going to the university, I started in a uh, I finished my military service, as I said, in November. The, the school year starts in October. Uh, so I was already late by a month. Uh, and you know, you haven't done any prep, you've done nothing. And in fact, when you leave the post, it was in the Suez Canal. They didn't have paved the roads at the time. So as you basically drive out from, uh, from the post, you know, shells, Egyptian shells are kind of running after you. And, <laughs> they are trying to chase you, which is not necessarily a nice game. And then you go into the university, you've missed already one month, and uh, you know you have this professor, he's writing equations on the board, and you're kind of wiping your eyes trying to figure out, just a second, sinus is this divided by this, or this divided by this. And, and a few weeks ago, you were dodging bullets. Oh, it, it was crazy. The first period was crazy. And then because they basically made me feel bad about not uh, uh, going into professional service, I committed to be a, a post commander in the first uh, break we, in Pesover, we have the first break in the school year. So I committed to be a, a, a post commander on the Suez Canal. So I go there and it's the same guys that were under me. Now I'm, a, you know, the retired the chief is coming back, said, guys, listen, I studied physics. I, this is too complicated. Give me the quietest post there is over there. This is it. <laughs> so it was for 30 days. It was quite like, you know, with short sandals and, you know, like a rabbi, you learn physics and you study physics. And it's complicated because, first of all, physics is complicated. But after you miss the first month, it's even more complicated. And I didn't do my exams because I had to go for the military service. 
Anyway, on April 1st, 1970, hell broke loose and we got shelled by 3,000 shells in an hour. It was, I think, the record uh, throughout the period uh, in uh, the Suez Canal during the Retrition War. When you get out, you just see like, you know, a D9 went all over the thing. It's just unbelievable. And yeah, there's injuries and there's uh, death and there's all that type of stuff. And, you know, and it, it's, it, would it be fair to say it? it, it I mean, I, I have no idea what, you know, an attack like that would feel like, but for Americans to put it into context, what, did, did it feel like a Pearl Harbor kind of event in terms of a, 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 a high concentration of, of um, bombs going off in a very short period of time in a very uh, small geography? Is that how very I should much, think about very it? Much, very much so. What they're trying to do, and they've done it successfully once before they've tried it on us, they shell the hell out of you. You obviously run into the bunker so that you don't get hit. Yeah. And they gradually shift the fire. You're in the bunker, so you don't notice that. You hear the shells from the outside, but you don't notice that they've moved it by 100 meters away. And then they send their uh, soldiers into the post. And we had one post that was extremely badly uh, taken over by the Egyptians. So since then, they've changed a, a, the procedure, so to speak. So when there was heavy shelling, the officer had to be outside, obviously if, behind the shelter, but outside so that if fire is being shifted gradually, you can actually notice that. And, and you were supposed to just shelling. be, you were supposed to be in a very relaxed position just coming back for a short period of time at that point, is yeah, that right? Very relaxed. Yeah, very relaxed. <laughs> Very, Mar very Mar nice. Were they serving margaritas uh, while this was going on, or what, what was that? <laughs> well, they did serve, I will tell you, but at the time, there was very high appreciation for those officers that did that. It was called Tiger, Namer. So luckily enough, when I got back, my margarita was, I obviously didn't finish studying for the exams, and I wasn't well prepared. But how do you, I, let, let me interrupt you for a sec, Yor, if I could. How, how do you mentally as a young man, I mean, what, what age are you at this point? No, then I was already in reserve. So I was, it was my first, so I was 21, maybe 22. Okay, but I mean, I know you'd had pretty, pretty uh, meaningful, if I could call it that, military service at that point. But 21 is still a young man. And, and you've made this commitment to pursue uh, physics. Did you, were you uh, working on your PhD at that point or where were you in the cycle? No, 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 no. That was my bachelor's degree. Well, bachelor's in the beginning. First year, bachelor's degree. I mean, that's starting from nowhere, so to speak. And so, you know, what's that like when you've made a commitment to physics, which is, as you say, I mean, a non-trivial thing to go learn. And yet you're, you've been pulled back into this horrific war. And then, and then you come from the horrific war where, you know, you had a real chance of dying. And, and I'm sure you knew people who suffered injury and you lost friends and, and, and comrades. And now you're back at school and you're trying to study and you're trying to catch up and, and all of that. So it's really, if you ask me the, what's harder, you know, it's like chopping your right hand versus your left hand. But if you ask me what's harder, a war or a retrition war, retrition war is harder than a war. Because in a war, you know, people talk about a war, but at the end of the day, if the war takes a six-day war, so in the six-day war, I was physically in battle in Nablus. It was, call it, 10 hours, and taking over the Golan Heights, another 10 hours, I was in real combat 20 hours. That's it. Otherwise, you relax, you get prepared, you do the drills and everything. Retrition war, you are there, and it's day and night. It's day and night. It's day and night. It's, think about it. It's, it drives you nuts. And uh, a guy goes to the toilet and doesn't come back from the toilets because they, when he was in the toilets, which obviously is not in a shelter, at least at the time, he doesn't come back because there was a shell that dropped right on top of it. So it kind of builds up on your nerves in a very, very uh, uh, tough fashion, much harder than a war. 
despite the fact that in the war you see injuries and death and the likes, but it's kind of concentrated. And this is 30 days, day, night, day, night, day, night. So you get back home, uh, I wouldn't say a nervous snake, but it's uh, you are really uptight and it takes time until you kind of offload and, and decompress. Get you know, and we hear a lot today about this thing called PTSD. Uh, um, you know, do you relate to that? Did, did you did you have some of that, or you know, how do you decompress, particularly when you're studying a very serious, uh, you know, uh, I, I got to believe when you're studying that kind of math. I mean, you got to have a quiet mind, don't you? It it wasn't an, the easiest period. It wasn't the easiest period, but it does prepare you a lot for. <laughs> for other tough stuff that happens uh, later on, so to speak. But that's why I say you mature, uh, you, 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 you mature very quickly, uh, or you don't. Yeah. Or, you de- or you take a nervous breakdown. So it's, uh, but as the saying goes, if it doesn't kill you, it builds you. Yeah, and I will always, I will forever be fascinated, Kiora, with those moments of truth that we all face in our life that, can make us or break us and the choice that we make in those moments and why some people get made by that set of circumstances and why some people get broken by that set of circumstances. And so what do you think it was about you that allowed you to come through these uh, incredibly challenging combat situations, go back to your education, ultimately become an entrepreneur and, and so forth? Frankly, I'm not sure I know, and uh, you know, you, you never know. In fact, in this event I was telling you about in the Swiss Canal, when we were shelled uh, massively, the same uh, day before I got a reinforcement uh, from another unit. And there was an officer that came in, and he was kind of dressed up, you know, with all the decorations and the likes, and he's going through. As the shelling got intense, he physically broke down and started running like a madman inside the post. You never know when somebody is going to break or not going to break. I don't know that there's a rule. Maybe psychologists know how to be able to tell one versus the other. Uh, Some people break, some people don't break, and some people it builds them. I don't know what enables one to uh, to do it versus another, but it's not easy. Those movements from military service to studying, studying to military service, and that's why I ended up in this technology unit at the end because physics. I'll tell you, physics is tough, and <laughs> when you go in and out and in and out, it's just it's it's not human. Hmm. You can do it it's once, twice, three times, but you can't do it on an ongoing basis. Going and in and out of those kinds of situations. I found myself in a ridiculous situation in Lebanon, just to give you an example. That's in another, uh, another thing that kind of eventually told me, just a second, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong here. I need to change. Uh, I was in the U.S. We were building up this uh, National Semiconductor Fab in Migdala Emek which is between Nazareth and uh, Haifa. And uh, at the time, there was a com- an airline called TWA. I don't know if you remember that. I, I sure do. Okay, and it lands in Israel at 5 p.m. And uh, that was on uh, Friday. And on Saturday, 7 a.m., I have two jeeps escorting me going into Lebanon. And After that hijacking? Uh, no, unrelated, unrelated. And I'm, uh, and I'm studying uh, the military service there, and one of the patrols is being attacked, and I'm the commander, and I uh, obviously rush into the area, and uh, we managed to kill some of the attackers, but some have escaped. So the drill is you block the area, you make sure that nobody goes in and out, and you raise uh, light shells so that you can see what's happening, but the first thing that happens is the UN comes in. They want to see what's happening. And the guys, most of them don't speak English. You know, the English is not, especially in the lower ranks in the military, English is not 
really a spoken language. So the guys are calling me, listen, we have here US officers from the UN and uh, you know, they're starting to push and we, we are kind of holding the line, not letting them in until we find the other terrorists and clear some of the bodies. And so I go, uh, I rush over there and obviously there's a US major and uh, I speak a little bit of English, so we start communicating. And interestingly enough, as we start this, it was fighting for time. You have to keep the guy occupied so the guys can get the job done. So, so you're, I just want to make sure I understand. You're sort of uh, placating the UN because you don't want them, and I'll put this in air quotes, helping you with your mission. <laughs> you want to do exactly. what you know you can do and what you have to do in this situation, and you don't want anybody meddling. And, and so you're the buffer. I'm the buffer, and the worst thing that could happen to us is that UN gets involved in the next day, it's in the UN. Israel is violated, not violated, killed, did. keep them out. So the best thing is to keep them out. So I start talking to the guy. On a Wednesday, I was in Salt Lake City, and this US major, whose name I forgot, he comes from Salt Lake City. So we start small talk about maybe it was actually working to gain some time so that the guys can complete the job. But more and more it became obvious that studying physics uh, and later on this event was specifically when I was uh, already building a wafer fed for National Semi, designing the most advanced microprocessor, the 32,000 family. Those things don't go together and it became clear to me that I need to go to the equivalent of DARPA as opposed to staying in the front line. It just didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And, and you had clearly uh, served your country uh, incredibly admirable, admirably on the front line. <laughs> There's guys that have gone through more. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But um, uh, no doubt you... Uh, no doubt you did what was required and what was asked. Uh, and so how, how, um, how rewarding it must be today to be working as an advisor to the military and combining your physics knowledge, your technology knowledge, your entrepreneurial knowledge with the military background you have to try to make it um, a difference today. So it's interesting because first of all, not a lot of people have gone through a very a similar track, so to speak. The fact that you know how the guy feels on the ground uh, is extremely important. Uh, meaning, you know, we have soldiers that I call uh, keyboard soldiers, meaning their military service is, uh, you know, on a keyboard. So we call them keyboard uh, soldiers. So it's, and there's total confusion today including in Israel, what is a soldier? And they're now trying to redefine it again because the younger generation, they want to go into cyber, it will serve me better later on, I can set up a startup, I get acquainted with the right guys. It's, the world has changed. Remember, I'm only 16 years old. Uh, the world has changed a little bit. Uh, so they are now starting to do some order there. Just a second, these guys are combat fighters, that's a real soldier. Uh, these are support soldiers and that's fine, we need them, it's something that's necessary. Uh, I'm the last one to say we should not uh, have them, but a soldier is a soldier and a support soldier is a support soldier. Well, and of so, course, we've entered an era today where a support soldier can control a, a drone or a robot even. And, and that drone and that robot can be involved in, uh, in a firefight, right? But right or not, and uh, here's the problem. At the end of the day, and I think U.S. Is, has discovered it uh, painfully. By, by the way, very similar to Israel, but we kind of pioneered that, unfortunately. Unless you have boots on the ground, you do not control. You can have drones, you can have missiles, you can have that, you can have others. At the end of the day, you need to have boots on the ground. And when you have boots on the ground, uh, a lot of terror effects can take place. And there's no other way but to have boots on the ground. And so you so, don't see that changing? You don't see all this new technology where 
you know, you envision a world where uh, the enemy has their drones and robots and shit, and we have our drones and robots and shit, and it's it's drones and robots on each other, and it's some kind of a weird sci-fi movie. Uh, yes and no, you know, the yes is that people are now talking about AI, BI, and you know, everything is everything is going to be done by computers to computers, and so. If you buy the if you buy into it, then the answer may be yes. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I don't see it happening in the next. Uh, there's lots of advancement and things are progressing very quickly. But uh, I don't see that happening in the next uh, 10, 20 years, so to speak. We're so still going to need boots on the ground. You will. There's nothing like a soldier that's there. <clears throat> that can smell it in there, that can smell the sweat, that can look into the eyes and see the eyes are moving quickly, just a second, there's something there. One of these days, maybe computers will uh, indeed take control, but uh, let's make sure we stay alive t- till then. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yes. My no task, but uh, worthwhile thinking about. Yes, yes. For, <laughs> I, I, I hope so for a very long time. So uh, I, I want to ask you about, you know, Startup Nation. And one of the things that has fascinated me about Israel for a very long time, even before my Mercury experience, you know, we hear a lot, uh, particularly here in the Silicon Valley, of, of such and such a place is the next Silicon Valley, you know, p- pick, pick your favorite part of the world. And for the most part, you hear that, and it doesn't really come true, you know, that whatever country, whatever city is doing X, Y, and Z to try to be the next Silicon Valley, and not much really happens. You know, maybe they have a few successes here and there, but they don't build an ecosystem and infrastructure that's anywhere near what has happened over time in Silicon Valley. And as I look around the world, and as I've traveled all around the world, um, you know, I don't know, uh, you tell me, but Israel has done as good of a job, if not better, than um, most countries in the world of building a startup and, and a particularly a technology startup ecosystem that is self-sustaining, that, that, that goes for multiple generations and um, that produces really significant technologies and companies and categories. And so I guess my question is, why do you think Israel has been able to succeed with that in a way that a lot of other regions have not? So first of all, in terms of numbers, in support of what you just said, Israel, I think it was in The Economist, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Israel is only second to the Silicon Valley, or Tel Aviv, excuse me. Tel Aviv is second to the Silicon Valley in uh, density of startups. So, I mean, every two guys that come together, build a company, let's go, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's been a lot of efforts to kind of crack the code on what what made it? Meaning people started trying to decode the Silicon Valley. Is it money? Is it uh, Stanford? Is it uh, what is it? And I don't know that anybody has had an answer because if there was an answer, they would be cookie cutting uh, more Silicon Valleys and more Tel Aviv. So I don't know. There's a single answer there. I can try and give you a feel for what I think uh, got it started. So one leg of it is that, unfortunately, because of the unfriendly environment we are in, we mature very quickly. But that's, in my view... As young people, you mean? Because at at 18 years old, you got to get very real about a bunch of shit that the average American 18-year-old doesn't have to get real about. Is that... Is it... I don't want to say simple, but is it as simple as that? You need to develop leadership skills. So you polish your leadership skills... I mean, it's not the same sequence that you do it in the in the U.S. for the reasons we discussed, but uh, the leadership skills are being uh, polished uh, very, very quickly, or not. Uh, remember, uh, war is not a party. Some people uh, die in uh, wars. Unfortunately, I had a brother that was killed in, in the battlefield. So I understand that war is not a game. So war is not a game, and it's not a... And it's not something you want to go to just to polish your leadership skills. But if you're forced into it, and at the end of the day, you're there. If there is value that you get from this, besides staying alive, 
it's uh, you develop your leadership skills. And everybody in Israel continues military service, right? Men and women. Is that still the case? Yes. Yes, but not all positions necessarily develop leadership skills, meaning those that uh, are what I call uh, keyboard fighters, uh, and they probably code better, they, uh, they are the smartest guys uh, probably to go into cyber and the likes, but for them it's not really leadership skills, it's some other skill. So one element is this, uh, the issue of uh, leadership skills. Uh, but that's not the whole story in my mind. If you go back in uh, history and think about Israel, Israel had its academia and uh, culture and the likes well ahead of establishing the country. I mean, education was top, 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 top thing in, uh, in Israel. We had a supercomputer, the fifth largest, five, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth largest supercomputer in the world uh, when we were living on food stamps in uh, 48, uh, 49, 52. Uh, we had a supercomputer, the fifth largest in the world. We hardly existed, we hardly had food, but we had supercomputers. So education uh, in Israel was extremely important from day one. And I believe it's part of uh, the Jewish tradition that study, study, study. If you're not a doctor, your mother would shoot you, so to speak. <laughs> you got a PhD in physics. You so Jewish. are you saying that, uh, that having a Jewish mother is a strategic advantage for becoming an entrepreneur? No question. <laughs> Look at Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, I, I've never met the guy, <laughs> but I'm sure that his mother was all over him like a <laughs> uh, So... Yes, they push you uh, hard for education. Education is very important in Israel. So you have leadership and you have education. Now, the country grew without any natural resources. So that pushes you to do more with uh, less, which in startups is extremely important. And, and fact, if I could just interrupt you, Gira, no natural resources with countries around you, some of whom, of course, are enemies, uh, that have tons of oil, right? So a tremendous wealth uh, right next door nearby and tremendous wealth with countries that nece aren't necessarily uh, happy to see you. Is that fair? The only disagreement we have is that you said some. They were all away. <laughs> it was Lebanon, it was Syria, it was Jordan, it was Egypt. Meaning we were surrounded, except for the ocean uh, that's uh, on the western side, uh, meaning we were surrounded by enemies. People. You know, it's funny. Uh, uh, recently, I was on a podcast that is focused on um, uh, veterans and veterans trying to improve their lives and, and many try to go in business and so forth. And, you know, so I was, I was thinking about the American military a lot and, um, you know, it doesn't get talked about, but there's a huge strategic advantage that the United States has, which is there are no enemies bordering it. <laughs> there are oceans you need to cross, right? That's not a joke. This is very serious. I Meaning, you, you, you visit us in Israel. I still Many remember times. you telling me, I'm not coming, it's dangerous, blah, blah. And after you were in Israel, you said, gee, I found my people. I, I, yes, I, I, and, and, and I was made an honorary Israeli, which, uh, <laughs> you know, I hold very close to my heart. And actually, a, a total side note, you know, uh, it's funny traveling around the world, seeing how you react to different cultures and different cultures react to you. And um, in India, by way of example, I, I must look like the elephant man or something because, uh, like, I'm a very ugly person in India, uh, apparently. But in Israel, uh, I guess you tell me because of the, some of the Russian Jew influences, you know, I, my lighter skin doesn't appear like it, I'm necessarily a foreigner. And my hairdo seems to be pretty popular, even with younger men, maybe because of the military. I don't know. You tell me. But it, and so when I go to a bar in Israel in downtown Tel Aviv, I'm fucking Brad Pitt there, man. And they don't realize I'm not Israeli. And so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just say very cheerful young ladies will come up to me and they'll just start speaking in Hebrew to me. And they're always surprised that, you know, I'm not Israeli. 
I agree. I Meaning you're Western, and until you open your mouth, you, and nobody knows yeah. that the guy is uh, speechless in Hebrew. Yeah, Maybe I feel I feel master. terrible, like I've done some false uh, advertising or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's by the way, speaking about bars, that's very interesting. You know, uh, two weeks ago there was uh, this. Uh, Innovation Week around the world. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's a, I think it's a UN initiative or whatever. So they ask a group of uh, some of these elderly 16-year-old, uh, why don't you guys go to a bar and give a talk? So I had these visitors from India. That's why it kind of reminded me. So I have a good friend who is, who is the CEO of what they call Tata Industries. Tata is a conglomerate with many, many there, companies. Aren't they one of the biggest? I've heard them described it, here as um, the, the Indian General Electric, right? They're one of the biggest yeah, conglomerates yeah, yeah, in the yeah. world. Yeah. They own, um, don't they own um, a lot of the car brands now? Don't they own Range yeah, Rover yeah, yeah. and all that stuff? So this is the guy I'm talking about. He actually did the acquisition. His name is Jamwal. He's become a close friend. The chairman of Tata. Yeah, Tata. Yeah. The one from Tata. He lives in Mumbai. So the guy is, uh, we have this innovation day in Tel Aviv University uh, that I'm chairing. And uh, he and his wife are visiting and we're good friends. So I said, uh, Jami, listen, uh, unfortunately, I've made prior commitment 100 years ago uh, to be in a bar and uh, give a talk about entrepreneurship. And they this is entrepreneurship week, so every night there's another bar. So and there's <laughs> 150 were registered. I just couldn't cancel out. So I said, Jamie, I apologize. This is going to have to be a late dinner. I have a prior commitment. I said, what commitment do you have? I said, well, I made a commitment to give a talk in the bar, and there's 150 people registered. I said, you know what? Great idea. I'm going to come. I said, Jamie, it's, uh, I, they, that's fine with me. And I'm willing to do it all in English, uh, but I'm sure you want to come. It's going to be kind of tech. So he did come. This is the guy that does a m a for Tata, does a lot of the strategy. Very, very, very bright guy. You yeah. can dive into every issue in a nanosecond. So we are done with the bar. The bar was packed. And all kind of questions. How do you sell a company? And how do you raise money? And uh, prefer shares? And all the... The whole Megillah. And uh, as we leave the bar, he said, Gyora, this was the experience I ever wanted to have. You know, we all talk about trying to understand the code startup nation. Until I got into the bar and I saw it and I smelled it and I looked at people and I heard the question, I did not understand. I'm not sure I understand it now, but it has taken me to a different level. So that's India for you, that's a bar for you, and that's high tech for you. <laughs> and so what do you think it is about hanging out in a bar with entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs that gave him such an insight into Israeli startup culture that, uh, you know, maybe reading McKinsey reports or I don't know what, uh, didn't? So I, I'm not sure I can articulate that. It's, it's in the air. Everybody wants yeah. to... And yeah, it's captive audience that wants to go into uh, selling their own companies. But the fact that uh, they all come, uh, and it's done over beer, it's nothing formal, uh, you know, it's, and they can ask stupid questions, they can ask smart questions, and obviously some are smart and some are smart. But there's no question that should not be asked. Uh, India is a much more structured society, and I, I think one of, one of the legs of why Israel is successful in startups. You know, in India, they have the thing that's called the casta. Yes. If you were a carpenter uh, from a, a carpenter family, and you are now a Stanford MD, you still belong to a different casta. You are not, just a second. Don't think that you're a genius from Stanford. You are kind of, I mean, the traditional. Yes, yes. As well. In Israel, the society is very unstructured, also in the military. Meaning, 
I hardly remember myself except when uh, uh, going home that I put my ranks on. You don't use your ranks. Uh, if you get to a point where you need to use your ranks, you lost it. And in fact, even in, you know, when I was still uh, in a line position, uh, managing uh, companies, and we would argue like hell on what's right and what's wrong, uh, which is very important to get the final truth out. And it's not, gee, I'm the highest ranking guy and we're going to do what I say. When the, the discussion and the conversation continued, I said, guys, listen, this needs to come to an end. Do you want me to put my ranks uh, on the table? In right. virtual ranks. You don't want to get there. So Israel is a very non-structured society. India is very structured. I think the non-structure uh, helps a lot in entrepreneurship because no, there's no right way and wrong way. Uh, you started something new. I mean, if it was something people done before you, then it's not, it's not for a startup. You're trying something new and you don't know what's gonna catch, what's not gonna catch. So it's not a question, I'm the elder guy, I'm the money guy, I'm whatever. We're all equal trying to figure out something. And in the military, that's the way it works. And another thing that works well in the military that serves you very well later on, when you're back from a mission, and, and you know it goes back to India as well, when you're back from a mission and you analyze, you don't start by saying, this guy fucked up here, and this guy fucked up here, and this guy fucked up here. You start by saying what well, I've done wrong. Meaning, uh, I think I should have done this differently. I think I should, this is my problem. I should have done it differently. As opposed to everyone, you know, pointing fingers at others. In high tech, it serves you very well in analyzing how to go and improve and you know, you're always trying something new and there's no single guy that knows the truth. It's really part of a discussion that comes out. And I'll give you an example that uh, I experienced uh, in one of the companies I'm on the board where we have uh, several thousand employees in India. The initial products that came out had thousands endless number of bugs. And it took us time to try and understand why is that the case? And we had the HR guys, and if eventually we flew in some of our managers until we get them to think like us. But one of the things that came out was that if I discover a bug, that's a black eye to my manager. There shouldn't have been a bug in the first place. From so a cultural perspective. Uh, Say it again? Uh, fr from a cultural perspective in India. From a, from a cultural perspective, right. So I'm not gonna highlight bugs. You know the problem with bugs? They're always being discovered. <laughs> and when they're discovered by a customer, it's that much more costly. Yeah, our QA department shouldn't be our customers, right? Exactly. So, uh, and that's again something that if you think about and India obviously has changed and is changing, et cetera, but what I'm talking to you about is an experience from 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so in Israel, at the get-go, you start by this is what I've done wrong, here's what I have to improve, et cetera, et cetera. In India, if you mentioned, on the other hand, uh, discovering bugs reflects bad on my management. So I, well, and I, I can to... remember, I hate to interrupt you, Gira, but I can remember at Mercury, uh, one of the things I loved was the level of commitment and responsibility of our engineering teams towards our customers. You know, a lot of tech companies, they use product marketing and product management to hide engineering and, and, and customer service to hide engineering from customers so that the engineers can just write software and they don't have to get feedback and, and, and so forth and so on. Whereas at Mercury, it was really the opposite. There was this feeling like if you wrote the code that fucked up the customer, then you were responsible and you had yeah, to get, you, yeah, right? Because you right. let it out of the factory. And, and so it, that was a very powerful thing. I, I had never been in an organization, and I haven't seen one since, frankly, where the engineers were so close to customers and, and understood the market so well very, very much so. Uh, it's, 
You know, it's very interesting, you ask about how did we become startup nation. So it used to be that the guys that were not good in R&D, that couldn't write codes, that's okay, we'll send them to marketing and sales and we let them do that. <laughs> And Israel has landed the hard way. So does that, does that mean that chief marketing officer is a fancy title for sucks at writing software? Exactly. Used <laughs> to be. Used to be. Used to be. That has changed. Uh, and this is a big change that has taken place in Israel. Uh, lots of respect for the sales guys, for the marketing guys. Just a second, we need to listen. We, we had so many failures at the get-go. Great technology that has gone nowhere. In fact, when you visit us in Israel and you come to my office, you will see I have a big layout of a chip that we designed at National Semiconductor. Thanks God it was on somebody else's nickel. <laughs> uh, it was great, great, great technology. We sold Zippo, zero, zero, like the number before one. <laughs> And the reason was we fell in love with the technology. We forgot about the market. It was the first dual pipe, 128-bit bus, MMU built-in, floating point built in, everything you wanted in a microprocessor. But uh, we forgot to talk to the market and understand how much they're willing to pay, what functionality uh, they're looking for. And, so I have it in my office to remind me every time I fall in love with technology, stop. Yeah, we, we like to say today, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. <laughs> I love it. Right? Right, right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when did you know you were going to be an entrepreneur or did you always know? Well, you know, it's interesting. I never knew and I never thought about this it, this way. The first thing I took on myself, again, I was born in a kibbutz and my father, my family were pioneers and you have this uh, chip on your shoulder that you have to uh, create jobs and jobs and jobs. So, Where did that chip come from? Was that from your, your family or from the kibbutz? Or? That's a combination, meaning the family, my parents pioneered the kibbutz in, uh, up in the north. Uh, next to Kiryat Shmona. It's right on the Lebanese border. The, the fence of the border is the fence of the kibbutz. So, uh, and I was born in, uh, I told you, 16 years ago, in 1948. So that was the independence war. Yeah. So it's kind of expected of you to create jobs, meaning you got education, let's create jobs. So the obvious thing for me was to, not obvious and very, not trivial, is to try and bring a, one of the top semiconductor firms in the world at the time, National Semi, to Israel, making a massive investment, I meaning it's a, designing the most advanced microprocessor in the world on one hand, and developing a sub one micron technology. It was the first fab outside the US, a sub one micron, unbelievable. I mean, only stupid young guys take such missions on them. I mean, <laughs> but I managed to convince uh, the management at Nation at the time, uh, Charlie Spoke and uh, Pierre Lamond. Uh, and they you know, I, don't, I don't know Charlie, but Pierre is uh, just legendary status. He is. He is. So... They actually Pierre was the driver and Charlie supported. Charlie was the CEO, uh, supported it, and we got the most advanced fab outside the U.S. Uh, started in Israel, and I'm taking you back to. Uh, I came back to Israel. I think we we broke ground in '84 uh, or '85 or whenever it was. So. Uh, this was, and this is really what got Startup Nation started because, yeah, we had great technology and we had, we had great education. But as I said, if you were nothing in R&D, you qualified to be a chief marketing officer. <laughs> so 
what the US companies brought in is the understanding this is product marketing, this strategic marketing, this is meaning that marketing has different facets and yeah. sales is important and, and the yeah. like. And that products don't sell themselves and don't market themselves, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, so that's. I never knew I'm going to be an entrepreneur uh, if you ask me what I've ever thought about it. I've never thought about money and the likes. But when I left National and I was thinking about, <clears throat> okay, what would be next? I felt that building something uh, of my own would make sense. But before I got started, I was called in by a, an owner of a company that's been around for a long time, 17 years, a company called Indigo. I don't know if you heard the name, Indigo Printing. Yes. So it was an old company, old, 17 years old, but the market cap was uh, 40 mil. And they were trying to change it into a real company. So I was brought in to make the change. And actually, the first job I did was to kill 90% of the projects. Become The company did everything and it did nothing. It printed on cans uh, for one nanosecond in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> if the temperature in the room was whatever. and it Only was, on Thursdays. Exactly. <laughs> so the first thing was to kill 90, 95% of the projects and leave one project. But that allowed me to bring money from uh, George Soros. At 403, we brought in $50 million. Uh, but that did cost me a lot of fights with uh, the owner because, you know, I was kind of killing his babies one by one. Uh, his name is Benny. And uh, then we got focused and we started cleaning up the mess with the one area that we decided to focus on. And that allowed us to take the company public at a billion dollars. Uh, on zero well, remind me what year that was, Giro, when you guys took Indigo public? We took Indigo public. This was a... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. I think I left National in 92. This must be 94-ish. And was 94-ish. that your first IPO? This was my first IPO. And it was on zero revenue, but we basically grew faster than the fastest growing company up to that point. It was a Xerox and Sun Microsystem. We grew in six quarters from zero to a run rate of $167 million. Meaning this was yeah. unbelievable. Meaning I had guys pushing the machines on the truck <laughs> at 11.59 so that at midnight the car and the driver would sit in the cabin and he would get, you know, revenue is recognized when it, it leaves. So yeah. one minute before midnight. It would leave uh, the shipping dock. Yeah, I know that routine. Yeah, I meaning you've been through the hoops with that. So, and that got me the first capital to do what I ended up doing, which is to jumpstart my own companies. Uh, many have been sold. So that you could, you, you made enough money there, you could self fund your own ideas or other companies that you were getting involved yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was offered money from others, but. If it's good, why share it? Uh, <laughs> if it's bad, why? Uh, if it's bad, why create ex friends? Exactly. It's an interesting thing in the venture community, right? When uh, an entrepreneur meets with a VC and the VC says, "Oh, you're not right for us," but I'll introduce you to uh, you know Jim and Sally down the road here. <laughs> They're sort of not doing Jim and Sally a favor, are they? Yeah. Right. So I. For whatever reason, I don't like losing money. I know it's a bad habit. Uh, and I don't like friends losing money. Uh, so uh, I ended up not taking money from anyone, but really doing my own thing. But we do come several angels together and yeah. get something funded and get it off the ground. And it's a and so, way. look, I, I know you're very uh, modest here, doctor, um, but it, it, you tell me, it's safe to say you were one of the very early angel investor 
slash entrepreneurs in, in creating the tech community that we now see in, in Tel Aviv. Yes? Uh, I think I would phrase it a little bit differently because I've spent uh, the first years building a national semiconductor there, which ended up being the springboard for, I was doing national semi and Do Fruman did Intel. In fact, both companies did, so to speak, together at the same timing. Maybe Intel started a little bit earlier, uh, by six months or nine months or whatever. But that created the infrastructure. The minute I left National Semi, yeah, but there were probably no more than three, four angels at the time. My friend Zor Zisapel was probably one of the first. Uh, but I, I was in the first text. Yeah, yeah you, I mean, look, if it, for people who have a reference to Silicon Valley and, and you know, Hewlett Packard being really the breakout company and then so many things that came after and of course, Intel for so long and less so today, but you know, there was a handful of companies and then a handful of executives as a result of that. And, you know, Don Valentine and, you know, there was a handful of people who were, were major catalysts in the creation of what we today understand as Silicon Valley. It is not, it, it is absolutely the case that you are one of that group of people for the creation of the startup technology environment that we now see in Tel Aviv. That is not an unfair thing to say. That's a factual thing. Let's put it this way. For whatever reason, they call me one of the fathers of the high-tech industry. Thank you. I, I, it no, took no, me no, this no, long no, to no, get no. you to say something that wasn't, uh, that wasn't uh, modest. <laughs> Because it's true. No, it's me. It's in others. Well, you know, there's that Kid Rock song where he sings, uh, you know, it ain't bragging if it, it, what is it? It ain't bragging. I think he says it ain't bragging motherfuckers if it's the truth or something like that, right? It's, it's that. It's true. It's not bragging if it's true. No, no. It's a, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be at the right time at the right place. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to identify some of the, brightest guys uh, in Israel to whom I really own my life, so to speak, because the kind of things that we created were just unbelievable. I mean, when you think about it, nobody sat at National Semi in the boardroom and said, okay, let's go and look at the world map. And you know, there's a, that little country there, you know, surrounded by thousands of Muslims that want to throw it into the, you know, that's a great idea. Let's go over there. And, <laughs> uh, that, that wasn't the way it is. And it was this way for uh, Intel. If it wasn't for Dolph Fruman, that was my mentor and my tutor in my PhD, nobody at Intel sat and said, uh, let's, look for, let, let's look for a place where there's some fire so that we can get something going. You, you need somebody in the inside that basically drives drive the thing and brings it. So I was fortunate to be at the right time when the high tech was starting to be formed. And I think I mentioned to you, my father was a professor in the university and yeah. the natural thing was to go back uh, after doing my postdoc at user aircraft, going back to the university. This is a year, uh, we came back to Israel in 82. Uh, and I left to the States in uh, 78. So the, the place for me was to go back to the university, but then high tech started and it became apparent that you can do very advanced stuff, very advanced stuff, uh, basically uh, without any, sa any financial sacrifice, if at all even creating a potential for an upside. Well, and you know, of course, we saw it here uh, in in with Stanford and and Berkeley, and of course, there are other universities, MIT, and you know, many others in the U.S. But that that sort of connection between government, university, and then using that to to kind of be the uh, foundation, if you will, or a foundational component, if you will, of, of a startup innovation kind of a culture, right? That there's some sort of magical uh, virtuous circle, if you want to get, you know, fun, you know, about universities, 
governments that are pioneering technology and then, and then entrepreneurial folks and capital. And when all that stuff gets sort of swizzled together, magic shit ha- starts to happen. And you sort of sat at the beginning of all of that. So, you know, when I took this position of being the chairman of Tel Aviv University, which is the largest university in Israel, we are ranked among the top 10 in computer science on the worldwide basis. We have more graduate students, masters and PhDs than the Technion and Bersheba combined. It's a big university. But who's, who's and, counting? <laughs> and who's I love counting how competitive you are. <laughs> No, it is. No, but it's a huge university. It's 40,000 people going in and out. And it's very, very uh, diverse. It was clear to me that if I take this position of being the chairman of the university, we talked before about staying in the military as long as you can. And listen, you just can't do it all. So you drop out of one of them. So to me, it was obvious that taking this position in the university is going to require some sacrifice in terms of number of startups I can deal with and, and be honest to my partners and, and the likes. So to me, the reason I've taken it and I've said it to the board and I've said it to my friends is really to end up having Tel Aviv University do to the Israeli economy what Stanford has done to the U.S. economy. And Stanford has done an unbelievable job to the U.S. economy. Uh, so this is really something to look up to and ask, what have these guys done right? What is there something for us to learn? How can we improve? Because if you do look at the U.S., there's much closer connection between the academic world and the VC world. Unlike in Israel, we still have this bridge. And having a leg in uh, startups, entrepreneurships, Ministry of Defense, uh, and then having a position in the academic world really puts me in a very good position to combine. You are, you are the human embodiment of the startup ecosystem. Uh, the government stuff, the education stuff, and the entrepreneurial stuff, you're in one guy. You're the, Venn, you're, you're the living Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit pushing it. But, uh, <laughs> no, but it makes it a lot of fun because, you know, on one hand, you see, I mean, with the boots on the ground, so to speak, if I'm to use military terminology, dealing with the startups, the young guys, by the way, it's very interesting. They always remain 26, 27 years old. So I don't age. I stay 26, 27. Yeah. So there's all the time, you know, they're coming from below. And so you have that. You have an overview from the top because in the defense, the type of stuff you are and decisions that are being made are 10, 20 years out. We will need this technology for this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in the academic world, you see some research that could end up being useful only 30 years out. So on one hand, you have, as they say, your boots on the ground. But on the other hand, you have your head in the sky or in the clouds. And the kind of the combination puts you in a very good position to fi- try and figure out what is it that is happening, about to happen, and the likes. Well, and... One of the many things I love about you, Kiora, is I know how deeply you feel um, that you are one of the stewards of Tel Aviv University. And, and you know, I'm somebody who cares deeply about entrepreneurship, as you know, um, because for me, entrepreneurship was not a theoretical thing. I got thrown out of school at 18 for being stupid, and I started a company, <laughs> right? Cause I had really very few other options. And, and, and so uh, this is leading me to a question, which is, you know, I came to a place in my life um, after my book play bigger came out and I kind of retired, so to speak, um, where I, I had some time to think, what do I want to do? And um, I had read about this thing that the uh, wall street journal called the decline in American entrepreneurship. And as you may know, according to the Brookings Institute and MIT, 
we're at the lowest level in recorded entrepreneurship in America and that more, more companies die every week in the U.S. than are, than are started. And that's kind of not okay with me. And so I guess my question is, where did this huge commitment of yours to entrepreneurship and, and innovation and, and students, you have the, who you are today is a, is, a, is a living, breathing commitment to give back. And it, it speaks so loudly, you kind of don't even have to say it. Where, where does that come from for you, Giora? Well, first of all, I wish, I, first of all, I wish it was correct. Oh, Second, come on. <laughs> secondly, it's really, you know, it's, it's where you grew up. It's how you grew up. Uh, I'm born in a kibbutz. I was in a youth movement that's called the Shomer Atzair with my wife. I mean, we were together from the age of 14. So you kind of grow into it if you were fortunate to end up doing what you end up doing. How can you kind of support narrowing down the gap? And one of the biggest problems Israel has today, even bigger, I believe, than the U.S. has it, is the gap between the have and the have not it continues to widen out. And, uh, you know, my life is great, building a company, selling it, building, selling it, it's, it's fine. Uh, but the problem is that we don't build enough big companies like MDOCs, I'm on the board of MDOCs, we employ in Israel, I believe 6,000, maybe 7,000. We employ in uh, India another 6,000. We have in the US several thousand, all in all we're 26,000, 27,000 employees worldwide. Big, big company. Yeah, very serious uh, company. Yeah, it is. Uh, so the question is, and that company creates a lot of wealth to a lot of people. When you do startups, it's really a small, typically elite group that makes the money. And uh, if we don't uh, figure out a way how to distribute the wealth, not by artificial ways, by, okay, let's increase taxes, let's do, that doesn't work. No. Uh, it's really creating more jobs, more paying jobs. So I really believe the challenge for Israel, and I've written some about it, was published in the local newspapers. We really need to move now from startup nation to industrial nation and build uh, more jobs here in the country. Take, take pharma as a good example. Meaning we have lot. I wouldn't say lots, but quite a few uh, drugs that were developed in Israel. You know what? Let's take a recent one, since I know the brain behind it. You heard about a company called Sky Pharma? Yes, and, and we talked a little bit about this at lunch, but um, I, I, it's something I wanted to talk to you about. So, so tell me about it. So it's a company that uh, started by Kite Pharma, is, uh, you know, kite, like the one that flies the kite? Yeah. Uh, started by the IP is from a guy I've known for many years. His mother and my mother went together to, they were both teachers in the same school. My mother taught his brother, Shmulik, and his uh, other sister, Esther Ken. And uh, this guy, uh, who is known today as Zeli Geshkhar, he asked this dumb question, how come the immunity system doesn't attack a cancer cell? Uh, meaning the immune system is good for a lot of stuff, but it doesn't attack cancer cells. Right, when I get a cold or I get an infection, my immune system goes to work and ultimately my body fights it off, right? Yeah, that's, and so the question so was, is, why doesn't... Why doesn't my body fight off cancer in the same way? Is that, is that how I should think about it? Yes. So what he discovered is that the cancer cells have a mechanism to cover themselves with a layer. I'm obviously explaining it in a very... In, in a way that a guy like me can understand, yes. I, no, good, good. even I... <laughs> I'm not about it. Not all of us have a PhD in physics, doctor. 
Yeah, but I'm not, but I'm not in, the, in a cell biology area. So in a layman's way explanation, apparently the cancer cells cover themselves with a, a layer that makes them invisible to the immune system. So the immune system does not exist and the immune system doesn't attack. So in this case, Typically in Israel, what they do is they license it to a big company and, uh, you know, the big company, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, has some dr uh, drugs, cancer, if you will, and uh, uh, some for Alzheimer that were developed in Hebrew University, for example. Uh, so you license it and you get initially a higher uh, single digit number back, kind of works its way down to smaller numbers, but you don't create jobs. So now the question becomes, okay, are we happy with this one, two percent royalty that's being paid uh, for license or uh, we do something in the pharma space? Switzerland has done it and has created Novartis. I mean, there's a long list of, they're not smarter than we are, but they do. <laughs> Meaning they've developed drugs, but they've created also jobs, and we have not. So I think that the responsibility that we have today, those that have versus those that have not, is to figure out a way how to narrow the gap, and narrowing the gap is through creating jobs, high-paying high jobs, uh, through this IP innovation that we demonstrated that we know how to build, and uh, not sell companies prematurely. That, not I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but that's one that drives me nuts. You know, uh, I just saw this. Uh, there's an underarm deodorant company in San Francisco called Native, and they make underarm deodorant that is made from real products, natural products as opposed to chemicals. And so I started using this product a while ago. My wife decided she didn't want me to die of cancer from putting... <laughs> these weird ass chemicals in my armpits. So, so I love this product and they just fucking sold a company not long ago for a hundred million dollars. And look, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know the founder from a hole in the wall, but you know, I'm sure it was a wonderful outcome for the founders and maybe for the early investors or whatever. But I look at it and go, why would you sell this company? This company could transform uh, healthcare products, you know, beauty products and so forth by taking a natural, uh, non-toxic approach. And, and you guys could have been the guys buying Gillette. And I think it was Gillette who bought them, but you'll for, forgive me if I'm getting it wrong. But so anyway, wh whatever it is, when I see a company that has massive category potential that is in the position to be the dominant category king and, and win this giant new space and they sell out early, it, it always drives me nuts because I, I'd rather see them play the whole game but for some reason uh, many don't and you know look you tell me if this is unfair it, ha it happens more often than not in Israel does it is that fair uh, that's fair that's very true and there's a couple of explanations to it you see uh, I had this example with a company called hyperwise that was sold to a checkpoint very prematurely meaning the company raised $2 million, spent $200,000 and got sold. And the founders got multiple digits in millions of dollars. So it's not a bad deal for them. Yeah, and of course you're happy for them. And I'm happy for them, but for me, it didn't, I mean, it, it was okay, but it didn't change my life in any way. But that's not the issue. The issue is when I tried to convince them not to sell, their comments was, or at least one of them, listen, I still live with, the, with my parents. I ride my bikes. I don't have a car. This thing is going to change my life. So there are two morals to the story. One, uh, Israel needs to grow up a community of second and third time entrepreneurs so they don't have financial pressures. That's one. Two, uh, we have not got advanced enough on the secondary thing, where you sit down with the entrepreneur, explain to me what the problems are. Why don't you sell some of your company uh, shares to me 
or to us or whatever. Yes. Get some money, reduce the pressure, and let's yes. continue. You know, because, right, we can do, we can do a, a uh, you know, a financing round here and the founders can take some money off the table and buy a house and buy a car and save some for their retirement. I, I get all that. Yeah, it, 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 and look, if I go back to our time at Mercury, and, and, and of course, I'm not stupid. Selling the company, particularly because of the situation we were in, was absolutely, there's no question in my mind, the right decision. But, and it's an important but, you know, you of course remember when we set the goal, the BHAG, to, um, to become a top five software company. And we were really going for that. And we talked about it so much internally and even to some degree externally all of our 3000 people believed it like they believe in air that we were going to be a top five software company. And it was a shock to a lot of our people when we sold the company, uh, even though it was for four and a half billion dollars, which at the time was an extraordinary outcome given what we had come through. Um, I got to tell you, there were many of us that I remember and certainly for myself, as much as I knew it was the right decision, it was very, very hard to let go of that dream of being truly one of the great software, long-term enduring software companies in the world. And, and, and I think we really had that chance and knowing that we weren't going to get to play that out, you know, was a big disappointment. I think it was a big disappointment to uh, all of us that were there, that have been on the board for a long time, because that was not the dream. But as you said yourself, uh, we were caught uh, under fire. Uh, there's thousands and zillions of things unrelated to us and related to us uh, that took place in the time. There was this backdating thing and the company was suspected of doing it. And many the stock has dropped down, customers were concerned. We delivered, which was nice. I say we, it's not we, it's you guys. I continue to deliver revenue numbers going up and up and up despite all these fireworks that was taking place in the background. You know, I'll never forget, and I, I really am dying to know what your perspective is, but by way of context, if I remember right, uh, Giora, we announced that uh, Amnon and Susan and Doug were fired on November 11th. And... Um, so we had, and if you think about the holidays and so forth, you know, we had a very short period of time to deliver Q4. And as you well no know, <laughs> no uh, all of our competitors came at us uh, to, to put us out of business, to hire our people, to beat us in deals, to tell people we were going bankrupt, to make all these lies, right? And, and, and I remember, uh, you know, there was about, I don't know, 10, or, uh, 10 of us or so, we sat around a big table and we took all the, the kind of big deals that were on, on uh, the forecast for Q4. We took all of our major offices around the world and we divided the deals and the offices up. And we spent, you know, I spent that from, from, from that day forward traveling all around the world. I actually flew around the world. I was in Australia. I was in Israel. I was everywhere helping to close deals and giving speeches at our offices to try to explain to our people why they shouldn't fucking quit, right? And we delivered the biggest quarter in the company's history. And, and that was such an extraordinary thing. And so, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about these situations that can make you or break you. I was amazed at how many people uh, in and around Mercury at a very senior level melted like snow in July. And then there was a handful of people who, you know, to quote my friend, the Navy SEAL, Chris Fussell, run to the sound of the guns. And I don't want to say anything that I shouldn't, but here, here's what I remember about you. There were people on our board who were terrified and who were, in my interpretation, this, you tell me if this is unfair, who were more afraid for themselves than they were concerned for the company. And the last thing a smart person would do would be to stand up and you were on the board. Not only did you stand up, you decided to become the chairman of what most people thought was the fucking Titanic. And you were that guiding hand. You ran to the sound of the guns. And so can you take me back to, you know, when you first heard that Amnon was gonna get fired and this was gonna happen and then, and then you make the decision to, to do what you did? 
So yeah, that was a talk about interesting periods and how do you get prepared for interesting periods. Yeah. Interesting in, uh, you know, in both sense. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, on one hand, it was uh, the ultimate stupidity because really, in fact, I think I mentioned to you, I, I still owe you a picture. Uh, the Rambo picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they called you the Rambo of business or something in one of the newspapers? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I was interviewed by a, a local journalist in Israel. And he asked me, uh, how did it feel? Uh, why did you take the job? I said, listen, I mean, the company for many years, I, I felt it was my responsibility, meaning this is not the time uh, to run to the shelter, so to speak. So he asked me, so how did you feel uh, when you took the position? I said, well, at the time, Rambo was a movie <laughs> that was running in Israel. So I said, well, it was like Rambo at the top of the hill. <laughs> so it was on the front page, a picture of me sitting kind of like this. <laughs> uh, it was Rambo at the top of the hill in Hebrew, you know, big picture. Uh, yeah, you do become a target that uh, they like to shoot you down for the SEC. It's a, a great success. It's not just shooting down a director. It's shooting down a, a chairman. So it does uh, make you more visible and therefore a better target. But uh, on the other hand, listen, uh, we've been, I've been on the board for a long time. Uh, this was kind of the time to stand and try and uh, help the company. You know, if there's nothing specially happening in the company, about position, you wine and dine and you talk some strategy and uh, you move on. No big yeah. deal. Yeah. A real board is being tested exactly at those difficult times. And I'm proud to say that out of all the boards that, again, I don't know what went in the boardrooms, but uh, at least as it appeared from the newspapers, there was brocade, there, there was converse in Israeli company, meaning the boards really were not standing in front of the company to kind of Yes. Shield, protect, and allow you guys to deliver the best quarter here, the best quarter there, and to keep the customers, to keep the employees. That's when, we got, when we got dis delisted by NASDAQ, those bastards oh, who didn't have to, those fucking assholes. But that said, uh, do you remember that Sarah Fryer at Goldman Sachs, because we, we, we announced our numbers that same day. We announced our numbers. We announced an acquisition assistant at. Do I, rem do I remember? Right? She, she upgraded us. And at the time, we were the only company in history to go to the pink sheets and get upgraded by Goldman Sachs on the same day. Meaning those were the days. So if you ask yourself, how do you tie a, what you do at the age of 19 being under fire? and you ask yourself what happened in Mercury and what prepares you for uh, this Mercury thing. Again, I don't know that it's a fact and uh, I don't know how you can prove or disprove something like it, but <clears throat> the fact that you have been uh, in some of those tough situations and here's another tough situation and you were successful in, in uh, N minus uh, one, kind of prepares you for event N and N plus one. And Mercury wasn't an easy one. The is it, was, is it, was it the hardest business situation you've been in? Or, or do you, how, did you, how do you think about it? It was definitely one of the hardest. It, it wasn't simple. It's, uh, the board was suspected. The stock went down to half, uh, meaning all the parameters went in the wrong direction. And the... Uh, Probably the thing that gives me, if there is a place to find satisfaction in an event like this, which was all negative, so to speak, uh, the positive is that there was a leadership team in the company that pulled it together and made it happen in an unbelievable way. And the board, instead of uh, board members running to the shelter, so to speak, we got an offer uh, without being specific on the numbers, 
that we said, thank you very much, we are not interested. And remember, the whole board is being investigated by the SEC. Send the company, goodbye, here's a big so, check. so, you know, about that, so, you know, the company's in trouble, we haven't recovered, we haven't done the restatement yet, and somebody's trying to do a lowball offer to buy the company, and, and, and let me say it this way, a lot of people could easily take the position, look, just take the money and run, leave this to be somebody else's problem, get the fuck, this is a burning building, get the fuck out. And yet you sit there and you go, uh, no, that's a bullshit number for this company. I don't care about any of that. We're worth a lot more. Tell those guys, that is to say the buyer, to go fuck themselves. How do you get that resolve when other people around you are melting and just and dying to get out? So I'll share with you a question. You remember Yuval Scarlett? Maybe you're still uh, do I remember him? Uh, he's a hero of mine. So Yuval asked me, did you guys have no brains or did you guys have big balls? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Frankly, I don't know what the answer to the question is, or maybe I have a guess, but it's not appropriate for... Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did take some guts, and it wasn't one round. It was, uh, they took it, they started here, they took it here, they took it here. Well, and the other thing too, the big problem we had in the company was the ability to get the restatement done. And of course, we missed multiple... Oh, no kidding, no kidding. Right? No kidding. And so... It, at the time you're saying, hey, listen, we're not going to take these fucking lowball offers. The, the number one thing that's going to that's gonna put the company back on track is cleaning up this accounting mess. And that result keeps getting pushed off and pushed off. And so you could argue that it was really stupid not to sell the company when, who knows, maybe we're never going to get this fucking financial restatement done, right? So here's something that happened behind the scene. Uh, we had... We worked with one of the top firms at the time. And you know, they kind of give you action items. So why don't you show us A, B, C, D, and E, and uh, okay, here's my homework. So we give you another set of homework. Uh, well, now we want to see uh, X, Y, Z. So you go, you ask, uh, you give it to them. No, 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 here's another list. So finally I said, listen guys, you got it wrong. Uh, and for them, it's billable hours, meaning they could have gone forever, forever, meaning it's, and it's really me, and I'm under investigation by the SEC to take the big guy into a quiet room and tell him, listen, I understand your responsibility. You give us a list of what you want, but this is the last list. No more list. This is it. Because we are going to stop cooperating Give us the final list. This is the list. This finishes this hourly billing stuff. And I know that we're under investigation. That's okay. I'm also a private person and uh, I'm telling you, it's, we're going to find ourselves in a courtroom. Private lawsuit. That's it. I had enough of it. And this really, I don't want to say that this discussion behind the closed door was the one that brought it to an end. But it definitely contributed to their understanding that uh, they pushed us to the limit, and that was one. The other one that helped us a lot, we brought in a, a very seasoned lawyer uh, for Morrison Forrester, uh, Bruce Mann. And when the deal was done, literally done, we agreed on the number, we agreed on everything. You know, it's not an email. It, they send you like in a fax machine. So yeah. there's no trace. There's no logo. There's nothing from... The only thing you can see is the fact... I don't think there even was the fax number from where it came from. <laughs> uh, no, because otherwise it leaks and, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, it's like, like a, it's, like a, uh, it's like a Mossad or a CIA communication, right? It's an unproposal. It's an unproposal proposal, so yeah. to speak. So they... Uh, bring it up, we finally agreed to the number, and uh, they basically take it to their board, and their board basically says that without uh, certified financials, there's no way to close a deal. Holy shit, what do you do now? And we were so still a very deal. long way away from certified financials. Yeah, I mean, you don't know how long it is. I mean, yeah. Homework, more homework, more homework. And the SEC keeps asking for this and that. And, and they're asking for this and that. I, I mean, <clears throat> it's a zoo. So 
we had this uh, seasoned uh, lawyer, Bruce Mann. Basically said, listen, I remember that before their school, there was a case of X against Y where you don't necessarily need the Wilson Sassoonier recommendation to the board of the acquirer was you can't, you can't have the deal without understanding yep. and having certified financials. So this Bruce guy sent some of the kids somewhere to the library. I remember this case going back, company X, company Y, where a deal can be closed without a certified financial. And sure enough, the kids came back with the case, and that was, that was the end of it. If it wasn't for him, I'm not sure where it would have been today. Well, and the other thing that, you know, I give you a ton of credit for was you ran a very thoughtful, with the executive team, of course, uh, process with multiple buyers who are interested in the company, and you put them through their paces. And the fact that you put them through their paces, and the fact that you made it very clear that we, in spite of the uh, situation the company's in, this is not going to be a fucking fire sale. Um you know, you ran a very effective, if I could call it, auction. <laughs> I would say a lot of credit also goes to Tony. Uh, we kind of split who's going to talk to whom. I he bet you I can, I can guess who the bad cop and the good cop was. No, no, no. We, were both, <laughs> uh, we interchanged jobs, so to speak, uh, Tony and myself. And he, he, managed, he talked to some, I talked to some. Uh, but uh, yeah, we had this goodbye get, bad guy. We had Goldman that uh, advised us and they kind of played, okay, let's make peace, let's figure it out. Uh, it was, but Tony played a major role in uh, getting this thing to be successful. The stupidity of the whole thing is that the acquirer could have ended up being a top, top software company if they would basically, one of the things that we negotiated, let us run the whole software thing. Us, I mean, the Mercury management. Yeah. And they insisted, we're the acquirer, we make the decision, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we finally yielded. Uh, okay, you do what you want to do. And it was very unfortunate to them that uh, the, the Mercury management, which was a bunch of killers, that could have taken them way, way, way up there. Uh, basically left after a short period of time and it was really a wasted acquisition in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly. I'd have to go through the list of senior folks. But if you sort of said, you know, the top 20 people in the company, plus or minus, top 25, I would guess that half of us were gone by the time of closing. Yeah, yeah, it was stupid on their part. Meaning, what are you acquiring? Okay, so you're acquiring some revenue, you're acquiring some technology, but without having the leadership in place that has built it, that has made it happen, what are you doing? Boards don't make companies. Boards assist companies, they give them a shelter, they give them maybe from time to time some guidance, some experience, but at the end of the day, it's the team on the ground. It goes back to boots on the ground, and the management team is the boots on the ground. You let them go, you're left with nothing. Huge mistake. But, you know, thanks God we were not on the acquiring side. Well, yeah. and uh, uh, thank you to God for Hewlett Packard showing up the way they did. And I, 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 they did treat us incredibly well. And I think they treated our people who stayed very, very well. And I think they took good care of our customers. It, it is a shame to see what's happened to HP software today. And, and I hope this micro focus thing turns out to be a good move, who knows. Um, it's, the big shame I think is, you know, to see where HP as a company is today. Um, it's a giant bummer, but um, look, I, I will never be able to thank you enough for your leadership. Um, Me? I you. need to thank you guys. You guys did the heavy lifting. We were kind of, you know, providing support, uh, air cover, so to speak. Yeah, but you but, know what it's like it, it, to use, and I didn't serve in the military, of course, but, you know, to think about it from a military point of view, the, the guys who are the boots on the ground need to know that the guys 
at CENCOM are, 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 are there on the other end. And when we say, hey, listen, we need some fucking airstrikes. It's getting too sporty down here, right? And, and, and so there was, there was this amazing relationship, as I remember it, between the executive team and the board uh, yeah. at Mercury. Right. I always look forward to those discussions. I always look forward to those dinners. There was a ton of mutual respect. You know, a lot of, a lot of executive teams can be intimidated by the board members. Uh, no, 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 there was none of that shit, right? Do I know that shit? Of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, it was a very symbiotic relations between management and board. And the management was a, really the board. Ne- Boards cannot win a war, same as... Uh, I said before, at the end of the day, it's the, an Air, Air Force cannot win a war and it's not drones and it's not that, it's not that. At the end of the day, it's the boots on the ground. And the boots on the ground is the company, the employees, the management team. Those are the guys that make it happen. The board needs to create an environment where management can lead and employees can execute and that creates the win. I see some boards that get confused about what's the, posi- what's the board's responsibility, what's management responsibility. That goes nowhere. Uh, we really had the right relations, and that's what allowed us, I think, that at the end of the day, if you look at this all backdating stuff that took place at that time, we were the only company under fire that came out uh, with our back straight and uh, uh, with uh, given the circumstances with the best results possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were others that I think, like Apple did pretty well in it, but I, they, they never... They did really well. They were never investigated. Yeah, it, they, they, for whatever reason, their investigation got cut short. So, I mean, of all the companies that went through the fire with the SEC, um, yeah, I mean, I can't think of another one that came out the way we did. So it's a lot credited to the employees, the management, and the fact that the board kind of stayed together and provided the air cover that's required for the company to execute. And, you know, there's another thing that I learned that I didn't know. Um, the customers were incredible. No the question. customers felt so invested in the company, in our technology, I know for a fact there were customers who increased their spending with us that Q4 because they wanted to see us come through the fire. And so there's an interesting thing when, you know, to your point earlier on quality and so forth, when, when you built a relationship with, in our case, you know, many multinational corporations over many years and we've been a good partner to them, uh, you know, they showed up and bought our shit when, when, you know, IBM was telling them we were going bankrupt and there was all this horrible <laughs> press and, you know, all this stuff was going on, right? And so uh, it, it was amazing because everybody showed up, the management team, the board, the customers, of course, the, 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 the rank and file people were incredible. Uh, there was such a strong culture. Yeah. So, uh, Gira, I, 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 look, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, <laughs> no question. As you think about the future, you're at this incredible place in your life where you're chairman of Tel Aviv University, you're, you continue in the startup community doing what you do, you continue as an angel investor, advisor to the Israeli military. You, of course, you've got amazing things happening in your family that we really haven't touched too much on today. But as you think about the future, um, you know, what are you most excited about and looking forward to? Really, I think that the next challenge is, as I mentioned to you, is helping, assisting, guiding, whatever language you want to use, on making Israel transform from startup nation to industrial nation. One, two, is really creating an environment where the academic world, in my case, it's Tel Aviv University, ties in with the VC community to contribute to the Israeli economy, same as Stanford is doing. Stanford is really a role model to me in terms of how this interaction between the academic world, the VC, the entrepreneurs should basically relate to itself. So if I'm successful with those, I, I'm happy. And then what about on the, on the personal side with your family and friends? Meaning, we still, uh, I think I mentioned to you, we still take a boat once a year yeah. for a full week. 
with the same guys that we served in the front line when we were at the age of 19. Same wives, same wives. Girlfriends that became wives, mothers, grandmothers. And we, every year, same jokes. Thanks God. <laughs> same stories. We all have Alzheimer now, so you can repeat the same joke and everybody is laughing as if it's the first time you <laughs> So You don't have to learn any new material. <laughs> yeah, you know, you new, new friends every day. Ah, you <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so it's, you know, we have lots of friends and a big family and growing with three daughters, nine grandchildren, spending... I, I bet you don't like being a grandfather at all, do you? What do you mean? First time he called me <laughs> grandpa, I was ready to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned to love it. Uh, so it's really all of it coming together. Life's been great. I cannot complain. Well, Giora, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you are an incredible inspiration. It is um, a highlight of my career that we work together and a highlight of my life that we know each other. Uh, your commitment to giving back to entrepreneurs, um, to giving back to your country uh, is, is incredibly inspiring. And um, look, this may sound corny, but I'm getting older and I, I, I don't want to fuck it around happens anymore. To all of, it happens to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I don't want to fuck around anymore. I, I love you, man. I, I think you're an incredible human being. And I can't thank you enough for who you are in my life and uh, for taking this time and being so generous with, with me today. It's a pleasure, Chris, and we'll be in touch and we meet again in the valley. Same restaurant, maybe another restaurant. But yeah, we can mix it up. Yeah, whatever you, whatever you like. And the next one's on me, Giora. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll give you a ring. Chris, thank you much. Thank you, brother. We'll talk soon. Wowie, wee, wow. Well. If you know somebody who would benefit from this conversation with Giora, why not send it to them right now? And we would love you just a smidgen extra if you shared this episode on social media right now. Um, we'd also ask you to go to legendsandlosers.com and subscribe there. Uh, and that way you never miss any of the action. And we have a lot of action. We got a new book coming out. We got a new spinoff podcast happening and uh, a bunch of cool stuff. So go to legendsandlosers.com and click on subscribe. All right. We would like to thank Tel Aviv University with over 30,000 students. The university is the largest in Israel. You can check them out at english.tau.ac.il. Verve Coffee, the official coffee of Legends and Losers. This is West Coast Artisan Coffee uh, from right here in beautiful Santa Cruz, California. And you have not had coffee until you've had Verb. You can check them out in Santa Cruz, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. Pick up a couple hundred copies wherever you buy legendary books. Equity Directory. If you're in the startup ecosystem, you need to get on equitydirectory.com right now. And you can, if you're an advisor or you're somebody who works with startups, you can find startups that are cool and hot that uh, want to engage with you. And if you're a startup looking for amazing talent who's willing to work primarily for equity, equitydirectory.com. Our good friends at onelifefullylive.org. They're the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check them out today, onelifefullylive.org. The incredible new book by my dear friend Kevin Maney and our multi-time guest on Legends and Losers, the book's called Unscaled, How AI and a New Generation of Upstarts Are Creating the Economy of the Future. One of my favorite podcasts with my friend Jamie J. Stop Riding the Pine. If you're a marketer or you're an entrepreneur, check out and subscribe to Stop Riding the Pine. PursuingResults.com. They produce legendary podcasts and this one too. Check them out. <laughs> interviewvalet.com. If you're a thought leader, get your leading thoughts on the leading podcast. Check out interviewvalet.com. You be the guest and they will do the rest. And our good friends at Second Flight Consultancy. This is Nick Cullen's business. They are the official growth hackers of Legends and Losers. I've learned more about digital marketing in the last few months from uh, Nikki than I have, I think, maybe ever. And um, they can do marvelous things to growth hack your company to the future. Check out Second all one word, second flight consultancy 
Com. All right. We must remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it right now. All rights do remain disturbed. We must, remor- re- we must reward you <laughs> that this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. In the event of business bullshit, we recommend taking two Legends and Losers and tweeting us in the morning. Go to school. Learn something cool. Don't forget to call your mother. There's no such thing as a participation award. Chill your nuts. Johnny Cash was right. Listen to Leonard Cohen. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Kanye West. Sorry, Kanye. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. We'll see you again soon on Legends and Losers.